a quick introduction. I'm Ariel Liebman. I'm a Associate Professor in the Department of uh, Data Science and AI with a focus on industry practice and energy systems. And I'm also Director of the Monash Energy Institute. And so we welcome you here all today. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, just to mention a few things, I wanted to welcome um, Sarah Goodwin from the Faculty of IT and um, Energy Visualization Expert, uh, Professor Paul Webley, um, uh, who's uh, leading the Woodside Energy uh, Collaboration, uh, the, the, the initiative, and um, Tanya Tan from the uh, Graduate Research Office of the um, uh, in, in Engineering, and then uh, uh, our uh, star uh, attraction, Lakshan uh, Bernard, who is our uh, inaugural 2019 AEMO uh, PhD student. And uh, they're all here to sort of take you through some of the um, exciting programs we have here. And so I'll go on to introduce them more individually in a second. So um, just, just uh, some housekeeping. Um, this will be a one hour webinar with about half an hour uh, for um, presentations and a half an hour for Q&A. It's very important that we leave enough time for Q&A. Um, uh, and and uh, this is recorded. Uh, if, if you're uncomfortable with it being recorded, well, actually, no, it's a webinar. So um, the panelists are all the only ones being recorded. So that's that's all fine. Don't need to ask that one. And um, please, during the Q&A session, raise your hands using the um, the participants um, tab of the or the Q&A tab of the uh, of Zoom and so um, yeah I also wanted to thank in particular Nancy van Nivenhofer who's organizing um, uh, organized this with us and uh, Srijan Pandey the general manager of the Monash Energy Institute a lot of hard work pulling this together so um, then I'd like to um, acknowledge that I'm hosting this information session. We're hosting this information session on the lands of the Kulin Nation. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all um, are, are standing, sitting today, and, um, and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining this information session. I pay respect to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connection to the land and waters of the Kulin area. So, um, yeah, so now we can sort of go a little bit towards um, the technical detail of this. Uh, we have, um, we have a, um, a very exciting, diverse energy uh, sector going on at the moment, a lot of changes. Uh, challenges and opportunities. The the climate change imperative is there to um, very much um, uh, for, forcing us towards a very um, substantial transition. And um, therefore, we uh, you know here as as a university sector, really uh, working very closely with industry of various flavors to to um, help prepare industry, Australians and, and the world to, to transition very rapidly to a low carbon future. And so um, I'm very keen um, to be able to, uh, uh, you know, very happy to welcome everybody here. And uh, I, I will hand over to our first speaker, uh, Professor Paul Webley. Thank you, Ariel. Um, Great to be here, and uh, and as you say, welcome to everyone here. My name is Paul Webley. I'm a, a chemical engineer by training, uh, so I'm in the Department of Chemical Engineering. I have worked in uh, energy and uh, sustainability areas for the last 20 years or so, and um, my role at Monash University is as the director of the Woodside Monash Energy Partnership. And for those of you that don't know, um, Monash and Woodside have engaged in a partnership uh, to the tune of about $40 million over many years going into the future. We've only just started, we're a year into it. And the, uh, the mission of this partnership, or the whole goal of it is, is for us to help Woodside decarbonize. So as you know, Woodside is a big LNG company and uh, they know that by 2050, they need to be net zero. And that includes the LNG they're shipping. And that's an incredibly difficult task and so if you ever really want a challenging PhD, look at a challenge of trying to decarbonize an LNG train um, between now and 2050, how, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna do it with hydrogen? Are you gonna do it with renewable energy? Um, what are the business areas associated 
with activating that market for all those new products. So it's a very challenging journey. So we've embarked on this journey with Woodside. The, um, the partnership is around three themes. The themes are new energy technologies, that being large scale renewables, uh, hydrogen energy, uh, how do I integrate those two? Uh, the second theme is, is decarbonizing. How do I take that CO2 that is produced and do something useful with it? Can I convert it into something useful? What do I do with CO2? How do I decarbonize LNG? So those are the technical streams. And then there's a very strong, what I would call a non-technical theme, which is the third theme of the engagement. And that's around the, the business policy regulation aspects and, and social aspects of decarbonizing. So this whole decarbonization, decarbonizing journey that we're on, how does this affect uh, the business models that are used in Australia? How does it affect uh, the social injustice of energy uh, in Australia? So there's, there is a, um, there's a really important component of that, what policies are needed. So those are the three areas. And so uh, you, if you look at those three areas, the faculties that are involved are engineering, science, uh, biz echo, and IT. Um, and so, you know, within those four faculties is where most of our programs will sit. So we have a wide range of academics listed on our website that's available to you to see who you could potentially work on. We offer scholarships for students. And so so there the are two kinds of scholarships. The one is a, a full stipend, $30,000 per annum uh, over the period of the PhD. Um, and the, the other option is if you really have a scholarship, we do have the ability to provide a top up what we call an excellent scholarship as well. And, uh, and so what we're looking at doing with this uh, partnership with Woodside and this journey that we're on is over the years as we go by, we would like to build a really good cohort of students who will be co-located in the new Woodside building, working towards a, um, a, a really uh, fantastic goal, which is how do we decarbonize and how do we meet our climate change obligations and working very closely with industry. So that, in a, in a nutshell, is what the, um, the Woodside Partnership is. I, I think I've taken my five-minute my five quota, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'd obviously be happy to take any questions when we come to the Q&A section. There are, uh, Tanya will describe, I think, the, the, the process. Mm -hmm. I would, the only thing I would add is we do have an additional expression of interest sheet uh, on our website that we want you to fill in if you wanted to do scholarships with us so that we can interview you and have a chat with you and, and, uh, and get to know you a bit better. So Ariel, back over to you. Awesome, thanks, Paul. So there's some really exciting opportunities there with uh, Woodside, one of the few major um, companies in Australia that's trying to make a really big, difficult transition to, um, to a sustainable future from a fossil um, past, which uh, is a big job, and I commend uh, the team for really taking that on here. So uh, now we have um, Dr. Sarah Goodwin, who's a lecturer in the Faculty of IT in the Department of Human and Computer Interaction. And um, she will uh, talk to you about the Zima Scholarship. Uh, and uh, uh, later we'll uh, move on to a bit of more administrative information that can be helpful. So over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Ariel. So the Zima Energy Studies Scholarship has been established to honor the memory of AEMO's uh, founding chief executive officer, energy reform leader and Monash alumni, alumnus um, Matt Zima. The uh, scholarship is designed to support the next generation of leaders to meet Australia's energy sector challenges. And it was created in partnership with AEMO um, and also with the support of the Council of Australia's Government's Energy Council. The, pro, uh, the program's purpose is to um, ease Australians' energy transformation in the, in the context of resource, resource constraints, energy reforms, decentralization, and the new uh, digital capabilities and build adaptive capabilities for our energy networks um, and the markets and underlying technical infrastructure. So this uh, prestigious scholarship uh, is, is based on a multidisciplinary disciplinary research approach. It spans the uh, faculties of engineering, um, IT and business and, and economics. So the PhD would be expected uh, to be co-supervised between the faculties, which enables uh, and ensures the true multidisciplinary approach to, to energy research and helps that shine through in, in your results. The, um, the program is intended to deepen uh, your understanding and unlock your full, full potential um, of leadership potential and to expose you to the energy um, industry and particularly to Australia's energy industry and industry network and, and um, build your um, 
build your network. So prestigious scholarship, it, it provides a, a, um, a, a 35,000 um, per annum and it supports you for the duration of the scholarship uh, or the candidature, which is about three and a half years. So both this and the Woodside uh, scholarship, they're industry-based uh, PhDs, they're slightly different from a standard PhD. Um, here you're, you're really, um, we're trying to uh, accelerate your career in this area and build the, the leaders in the energy sector. Um, this is because you, you have the ability to, to be um, really um, supervised con in connections with energy uh, partners, you can have industry placements, um, and then you have that connection um, with the industry, which is quite unusual um, for other PhD students. That will also allow you to be challenged and help you to build up and, and start to understand the, the complexity of the problems, but really um, from the industry's um, current day um, the issues and helps you solve those, um, those um, problems um, with them uh, alongside you. So uh, we're really excited to, to see um, both of these scholarships happening here at Monash. They're really um, um, great and uh, look forward to seeing um, who, uh, yeah, all the candidates. Thanks, Thanks Sarah. Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and uh, yeah, look, it's really exciting, you know, doing a, an industry focused PhD in an area that, in fact, Australia is leading the transition on. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's difficult, but uh, for better or for worse, we're uh, moving very fast. So doing something with AEMO and Monash, you're really at the cutting edge of global energy transition and uh, it really positions you well. For a for a very diverse and exciting future, an important future too, in terms of contributing to to um, you know planetary uh, well being. So um, now I'm uh, very pleased to introduce uh, Lakshan Bernard, uh, who will um, tell you a little bit about his experiences with this scholarship so far, and uh, hopefully he'll tell you a bit about you know how it's going with the supervisors, and it's all a bit challenging, I guess, working from home doing a PhD. And uh, yeah, so over to you, Lakshan. Uh, good afternoon. Um, uh, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, today I'll try to give a student's perspective on um, why I applied for the Zima Energy Studies Scholarship and the opportunities it's given to me so far. Um, I prepared a couple of slides, so I'll share my screen. Okay, so I'll first talk about why I applied. So last year I was in the final year of my uh, electrical engineering degree. And so it was a bit of a stressful time because there's a bit of uncertainty about what happens next. And um, there's a lot of choices to make. So for me, a PhD is an opportunity to learn more in an academic set setting that I was familiar with. Um, so in my undergraduate studies, I felt like I learned the basics, but I wanted more time to really explore um, in more depth and to be able to hopefully contribute to the field and make some discoveries. So that's that was like my ambition. Um, the concerns I had with a PhD was firstly, I was unsure how to choose a topic that has uh, great applications. And also I was um, a bit worried about what would happen after the PhD was over. So then my um, supervisor, uh, my lecturer at the time, who's now my super, supervisor, Dr. Reza, um, told me about the Zima Energy Studies Scholarship. Um, so the more that I researched into AMO, I realized that um, their goal or, and their role of securing the, um, ensuring this uh, power system security means that they are um, directly involved and directly interested in the latest research. So that's why I was convinced that the collaboration between Monash and AIMO would be very like um, successful and very mutually beneficial. Um, so now I'm about six months into my PhD. And um, even, even now I've had enormous amounts of opportunities that I um, haven't experienced before. So the first is um, uh, the excellent supervision that I've received at Monash University. So um, as it's been discussed before, this is a multidisciplinary project. So I have two uh, supervisors. My main supervisor is from the Faculty of Engineering, Dr. Reza Razaghi. And my other supervisor is Professor Rob Hindman from Monash uh, econometrics and business statistics. So both of uh, my supervisors, they're experts in their field and they're really great researchers. Uh, so I really value the guidance that they've given to me so far. Um, we're also really lucky because we've had meetings with experts at AIMA. And I think this industry insight really helps me, especially in the first year to frame a project that is uh, practical and realistic and also 
are interesting to industry. And it's and the industry insight is also um, often it's lacking in um, the academic papers that I've been reading. So uh, being able to meet with the experts at AMO once a month has been really like beneficial for me to uh, frame my project. Um, the third bullet point is about data. So so any research, any applied research um, is really dependent on the data that you have. And so AMO is in a unique position because they have so much data related to the power system available. Um, and oftentimes, sometimes industry might be reluctant to share their data, but because of the collaboration between AMO and Monash, um, there's uh, there's really no like administration hurdles or anything. So all the data that I need for my research, AMO is willing to provide. So um, that's like an awesome benefit to have. Um, and so uh, recently I've started spending one day a week um, working in a team at AMO. And so this is so that I get familiar with the systems at AMO. And that's why I've listed the fourth, fourth bullet point as professional development, um, because that's, a, I think, a bit unique in this PhD program, so that I develop skills um, that, so that once, once the PhD is over, um, I, um, I, I have practical skills that are, are relevant in the workforce. Um, so the last slide is just uh, talking about my topic a bit. So um, as Ariel mentioned at the start, now we're moving um, because of uh, uh, we're moving into more renewable uh, types of generation. So what this means is that the traditional types of synchron synchronous generation is being reduced, which means that it becomes more and more important for AMO to be able to regulate the system strength. Um, and so the reason is because um, AMO has experienced that there's sort of uh, problems that are associated with connecting renewable sources to weak parts of the grid. So it's important to find ways that we can um, strengthen the grid essentially. Um, so the task that I'm working on is seeing how we can use um, streaming data that, that could be from the SCADA systems or uh, more recently from PMU data, how we can use that to um, characterize system strength. Um, so the first step I'm doing is trying to find statistical ways to characterize system strength. And then the second goal is to regulate it. So it's like a very interesting problem for me. And so I chose the topic based on my background in uh, electrical engineering and my interests uh, in maths and computer programming and statistics. Um, but obviously there's a wide range of topics in the energy sector. So if you're more interested in sort of the markets aspect, that's also a direction you can take it in. And there's a, lo a lot of research in that field and also IT as well. So, um, and machine learning because of all the um, large sets of data. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that the energy sector is such a um, diverse place because I think anyone can find a topic that they're interested in uh, to apply their talents. Um, so thank you for listening to, to me and hopefully um, I wish you the best of luck for your future endeavors. Thank you. Awesome, thank you Lakshan. That was a very, very useful and, um, and, uh, and broad ranging uh, discussion on uh, your experiences. And I, I think there'll be a few questions later on. So uh, yeah, I think we're, we're nearly at the end of the formal part. So um, I'm now hand over to Dr. Tanya Tan, who's the, um, Graduate Research Manager in the Faculty of Engineering. Tanya, over to you. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Um, good to see you here. Um, with our PhD, um, our graduate research degree um, consists um, obviously of a um, thesis um, which you are putting together based on the project you're working with with your um, two supervisors. So each um, PhD student has two supervisors. Um, and for um, these two particular unique scholarships, um, you do need to have um, two supervisors from two different faculties um, because it is a multidisciplinary project um, and you will be um, getting, gaining expertise from um, both uh, two different faculties. Um, the entry requirements for the course um, is a four years bachelor's degree in a relevant field. Um, pretty much, um, so if you came, um, if you completed an engineering degree, it would be a Bachelor of Engineering Honours um, with um, grades of um, H1E. Um, so that's pretty much at Monash, um, grades of 80% and above. Um, if you are coming um, to do a PhD after completing a Master's, um, that is fine as well. Um, for the Master's qualifications, um, you will need to have completed a um, either a bachelor with honors or a master's with a research component. Um, that is the academic um, 
entry requirements. There is also um, English language requirements um, which are required if you um, didn't, if your first language is not um, English. Um, and we can certainly um, provide some further information and assistance on this um, if you do need um, any assistance in this area. Now, this is probably the most important slide here. Um, how do you apply? So if you're interested in um, taking up one of these um, energy projects, if you're interested in um, applying for um, either the Zima or the um, Woodside Scholarship, um, then um, these are the steps you um, need to take. Um, first thing is obviously check your eligibility. So if you've um, done a bachelor with honors um, or um, a master's with a research component, um, those uh, and obviously with your grades as well. So that's your eligibility. The next step is to uh, find a supervisor. So on the um, Monash Energy Research, um, Monash Energy Institute um, website, there um, uh, is a fantastic page there with a whole list of Monash Energy researchers um, and the link is um, actually listed um, here on this slide as well. Um, you can go through their profiles um, and you can, um, if you see um, an academic who's researching in an area which you're interested in, um, you can certainly contact that academic um, and submit what we call an expression of interest. Um, on the website as well, there is um, a particular expression of interest form which you can um, actually submit um, as well. Once you uh, have communicated with your supervisor um, and if both parties are happy, if you're happy, they're happy, um, they will issue you with an invitation to apply and then you can formally apply um, in the system. So the, the application um, closing date, and this is something important to keep in mind, is at the end of October. So um, please try and submit your application earlier and don't wait till the last day because um, sometimes um, when too many people get onto the system on the last day it does tend to crash so um, try and submit your application a couple of days earlier um, if if you are going to to submit an application um, this slide just covers um, the Zima, Zima Energy Study Scholarship um, and the opportunity and the amount um, and this is all on the website as well. Um, and we've got one uh, for the wood side as well. So the, the general process is pretty much the same. Um, you submit an expression of interest, um, find a supervisor, then you submit um, a formal application um, and include all your qualifications. If you are a Monash graduate, then um, uh, we are able to access your qualifications. Um, and, but if you are not a non-Monash um, graduate, then please do upload your um, qualifications. And um, yeah, this last slide is just some information on some key resources, um, some key links, um, and I'm sure Nancy um, uh, will be able to send out these slides to you um, at a later date after the webinar. Um, and if I'm happy to take any questions later on at the Q&A as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josh. Oops, this is a bit of a feedback there. Um, so thank you, Tanya. Is, um, maybe somebody can mute. If, oh, thanks. All right. So um, yeah, we're now pretty much wrapped up the the formal uh, part of the session. As you can see, there's there's a fantastic opportunity here for both um, with Woodside and with AEMO. And uh, I think it's best just to get into some uh, questions. There's quite a few questions already and I imagine there's a few more. Um, so uh, yeah, I will launch into the first question. Um, there were a few that we answered already. One of them actually um, is probably worth checking in with again, um, you know, to be able to do a tutoring, tutoring assistantships, etc. Uh, is, that, is that available? Uh, I mean, is there is that allowed under the rules of the AEMO and the Woodside scholarships? So that's a question for Paul and um, uh, yeah. Look, uh, absolutely. I don't see any reason why it should be any different to to uh, conventional uh, PhD. Um. Yeah. Just uh, to confirm that I've been able to demonstrate um, like normal. Yeah. Excellent. To say someone else also. There's a couple of. Um, comments also in line with that other questions uh, about 
is is a full time is a PhD full time and how much time do you have to pursue other work interests? Um, yes, a PhD is full time, um, but you do have time on the side. Like you can have a part time job, or, or as as um, as we just heard, you can you can work one day a week. Um, like I, like I will say that like the work that I do one day a week, it's still related to my PhD. Yeah. Um, so I think especially in the first year, it's important to um, dedicate a lot of time. I think um, from my undergraduate degree, sometimes there's a, a tendency to like, maybe you can get away with doing a little bit of work and then cramming for an exam. Whereas with a PhD, you need to like have a steady um, amount of work. So it's good to treat it like a full-time job, I think. Yeah, it's like a full-time job. Um, certainly when I had, did my PhD, I had a part-time job on the side. Um, or so a lot of our PhD students do tutoring. They're, it's related to their work, so it helps um, them build their knowledge, but it's um, it's something they can do on the side for extra money. Uh, someone also asked, is this available part-time? I don't think so. I think these scholarships are full-time scholarships. Yeah, three and a half years, I think. Yeah. So uh, it's worth noting that, that the significant part of the scholarship is tax free or the whole um, is, is the whole scholarship tax free, Tanya? Um, yes, um, because it's a scholarship, it is tax free. Um, whatever income you earn on the side um, from whatever job, then that will be taxed, but the scholarship will not be taxed. Okay, great, thank you. So um, uh, there was a question about how many positions are available, how many scholarships is uh, Woodside offering this year? So um, we have a total of six that we can offer over the next three years. And we would be unlucky to allocate them all next year, but um, we would be looking at obviously up to probably three, I would say, for next starting next year. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so three this year, you think up to? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's good. Um, okay. Next question. Uh, oh yeah, there's a question around. Um, Someone had a, actually, no, I'll start at the beginning. Uh, so uh, what are the prospects for an international student to apply for these scholarships? And um, the answer is you have to be an Australian citizen or a permanent resident for the AEMO one. I'm not sure if, if there's equivalent ones for Woodside, Paul. No, there's no, there's no constraints. Um, it is only a single, scholarship, a, a living scholarship. It's not a tuition scholarship. And so clearly you would have to be awarded the tuition scholarship in order for you to be able to, to study. So it's a single scholarship. But we don't mind if the candidate is international or local. Oh, that's great. Um, so citizenships, I think we answered the citizenship question as well. Yeah, so I'm just going through clicking them. Oh, great. So um, there's a question about um, Oops, they keep jumping up when you do that. <laughs> they changed they changed location in my screen there. Um, uh, so a, as a master's student of electrical engineering with a merit scholarship, um, will I be eligible to apply for this scholarship program as a top up? Uh, that's a good one for you, Tanya. Um, if you're applying for the PhD, um, so if you are um, transferring uh, into the PhD or, or if you are finishing up your master's and then applying for the PhD, then um, yes, you can apply for a top up, uh, for the top up. So, so, um, and so but, but I think the, the idea is this is a full time scholarship with a very much focus on a AEMO centric uh, or a, a topic of interest to AEMO. So, um, it, would, it could be difficult to use it as a top up to another project that, which may not be as relevant. So I think the preference very strongly is towards a, a brand new project um, or at least um, a project that's completely aligned with the scholarship and you know, to be fully funded by the scholarship. So um, next question is, uh, I like this one, I've finished the bachelor's in 2016 with Four publications in Q1 journal. Shall I? Am I eligible? And I think it's it's, it's there's a depends question in there probably, but I'll let Tanya answer it for with an engineering perspective. Uh, it's probably somewhat depends on a 
on your results in the bachelor's, but certainly the four research publications are, are a big bonus. But, but are they enough, Tanya? Uh, yes, yes, definitely. Um, having four research publications in the Q1 journal is certainly um, a, a very big plus. Um, yes, as Ariel said, it, it depends. Obviously, we have to look at your um, qualifications um, and the grades you achieved in your bachelor's, but your research publications will actually boost your score um, and um, definitely make you um, competitive. So, as with um, all scholarships, they are highly competitive. Um, so, you know, it, it is it is um, it is a very competitive scholarship. So, I would suggest you certainly submit an, an EUI and certainly, you know, um, yeah. contact some supervisors, and and we can certainly um, have a look at your qualifications and go from there. Great, thank you, Tanya. So. Uh... Does a two-year master in advanced engineering degree meet the minimum eligibility requirements um, on top of a, a standard four-year bachelor's without honours? I think it, it, it's a depends again, isn't it, uh, Tanya? If you've completed a um, research component, so a thesis or a dissertation or a research project component, either within your bachelor's or your master's, um, then usually, yes, you are most likely to be eligible. Um, and then obviously we, we would ne then need to look at your grades as well. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question about the General Energy Scholarship on the website as well. I'm not quite sure what that might be referring to. Um, I think the, any other general in its scholarships are basically just applying for a standard uh, APA scholarship and, um, you know, finding a supervisor in the energy space, which is very much the, the on the cards. With most of our students we get who want to work in energy are um, getting these general scholarships. And so, um, yeah, please, please contact me or, or um, someone else directly, uh, Tracy. If you want to understand uh, in a bit more detail, I'm happy to, to respond to that. Um, I think there'll be emails somewhere, um, uh, addresses at the end of this, and if they won't, then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll share that on to, to the mailing list. So, um, uh, okay. Master's degree with coursework from Monash, will these qualifications be eligible for these scholarships? Um, so, yeah, it, it has to be a, a it doesn't have to have a research component, does it, Tanya? But it has to be very highly ranked um, in terms of the marks. I mean, yeah, the marks. Um, if if there is a research, so there needs to be a research component or some research experience within um, an applicant's qualification. So either within your bachelor's or within your master's, um, you need to have done some form of research. So um, usually with the master's by coursework, there is usually um, either a one or two unit um, research project unit. Um, so if you've completed that, then yes, you are most likely eligible, but you do need to have completed at least a research component, usually 25% of the degree. Thanks, thanks Tanya. Um, there's a question that uh, for Paul, and uh, Paul, can you see that question at the top of yes. the list now? Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe leave it to you. yeah look, look, let me, let me, uh, let me talk to that. So this is in regards to top up scholarships. Um, and I'm inferring from this question that the, the, um, the person is already does have the scholarship and is working on a project. They've started the PhD and would be looking at a top up a bit later. And then the question is, would Woodside, because they're giving you a top up, expect you to change the direction of the research? Uh, or, uh, or would they also then be obligated to help you with that project? So just a little bit, a word on the top up. Typically, the top up would work by, um, we have a Woodside project that we've worked out with them. Um, it has an opportunity for a PhD. We have the PhD scholarship. Um, but let's say that um, you, you get a scholarship from, from Monash um, and then we start the project and then you get the top up scholarship uh, after application with Woodside. And then, of course, that project has been worked out with Woodside and off you go. And so that's, that's the typical model of the top up. We do have some students that have received the top up after having already started the PhD. They've been almost a year into the PhD and, we've, and that project is squarely aligned with Woodside's interests. And in that instance, uh, the, in fact, that's one of the, the, uh, the sort of not the criteria, but one of the considerations around the, the top up is how aligned is this research with, with Woodside's interests. And um, I have to emphasize Woodside and ourselves are 
quite flexible in terms of, uh, you know, we're understanding that a, a key portion of the of the partnership is around training and generating the next generation, uh, uh, creating the next generation of scientists and engineers and 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 business people. So um, it's certainly within the scope for us to award a top up. Certainly within the first year, I would say if you're coming to the end of your of your PhD and you've sort of only been, you know, twenty percent in the area, we're unlikely to give you a top up at that stage. So again, it's one of those it depends answers. Um, but the, the best thing to do is just to contact me and, and uh, we'll take it on a case by case basis. Great. Thank you, Paul. And um, do you open the opportunities for the candidate who are candidates who are pursuing the mas a master's degree by coursework? Um, so I think the, the answer is that you need to finish your master's first, ideally, before you um, start a scholarship. You can probably apply before that and see if you get it, but you'll get it, you know, you'll have to finish um, your um, master's first. I mean, you could uh, get in on the merits of your existing marks, um, but uh, Tanya, do you have any sort of more, more thoughts on that? Um, if the master's is the qualifying degree, then they would have to finish the master's um, before um, they started the PhD. Um, so it will depend on how much you have left. So I'm not familiar with the length of that uh, master's course, but if you've got more than um, a, a semester left, it's so then you would need to finish or get closer to finishing that and maybe apply for the next round. Yeah. Also, uh, I think in there is to... Um, to know it says by coursework, I, I'm not sure because it's anonymous um, whether that means that this student is pursuing the research component. So there's there are research minor thesis components to to all our master's degrees, especially and I know there's masters of data science. So uh, I would encourage those who uh, are interested. Um, yeah, that that component, the research component, is very relevant to to your scholarship um, application. Right, next question. Um, how, how is the workload spread over the three years? Uh, I, I can answer that. That's an easy one. Uh, well, it's full time for three years and three months, actually. And um, I mean, you know, the, the, the swings and roundabouts and, uh, you know, you get a chance to pick up pace. But, you know, you, the best way is to make steady progress all the time is if you're working a nine to five job, roughly. I mean, you know, the hours are super flexible, right? And, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's quite a nice lifestyle if you can, um, you know, if, if that's uh, what you're looking for. And, um, you yeah, know, certainly, uh, you know, I very much uh, enjoyed it when I did it. But there's a few challenging times, obviously, you nobody's know, come. But, yeah, so has that sort of answered the question? You can add a, add a, um, um, and a second question, Alex, but, uh, go for it. Um, do you have to have a fully developed proposal in, or an area of interest? Um, any tips on when, where areas of interest can be sourced? Uh, well, so I can answer for the AEMO scholarship, which I'm more familiar with. No, you don't have to have a fully developed proposal. Um, uh, you can, uh, uh, you can just um, identify a potential uh, supervisor and work with them to work up a project. Um, that's the ideal way. So, um, and we can help you sort of one-on-one -on -one with identifying areas of interest. And so uh, with, with Woodside, I'm not sure, Paul, do you have any sort of thoughts on that? Um, no, with, I mean, a lot of the Woodside projects that we develop, you know, we develop a proposal with Woodside and then we seek out students as part of that proposal. Um, but there's certainly a scope to do a, um, you know, for the student to develop a, a set of ideas enough for us to pitch that at, at Woodside and work that into the general theme of the of the project. So both are absolutely within scope. Great. Um, so I've got another interesting question from uh, Tracy. Is a uh, preference towards engineering, maths, computer science, economics? Uh, I'll add in there. Uh, uh, versus uh, the the broader social sciences and human behaviour. So. Um, so there, there is a sort of a, a bit of a constraint, but it's 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 not it's not a hard constraint in that it, 
the PhD is primarily in two of the three faculties of engineering, IT, and business and economics. And I don't believe there's anything in, at least in the uh, AIMO case, sorry, I'm talking about AIMO specifically. Um, uh, I believe uh, Woodside is, is purely a, um, uh, it's an engineering, is, is it also for the three faculties, Paul? Uh, we, we have well, actually four faculties involved in, in Woodside, IT, the ZECO, um, engineering and science. Although I will say one of our projects with Woodside actually has law in it as well. And, right. uh, and the Sustainability Institute. So we're not too fussy. Uh, you know, problems don't come packaged in, in disciplines. They are whatever the horsepower you need to, to deal with them. So we're not fussy. Mm -hmm. I also can say very much so that the human centered computing group in IT is, is huge. Um, and that's we also we're very much linked to human side, social science side of things. So um, it's just about identifying the right the right people. Um, so yeah. um, nice question. Add, um, yeah, it, it is a good question. And, and it's worth noting, particularly in the human centered computing department, there is a group which is um, a subgroup called the Emerging Technologies Lab, uh, run by Sarah Pink and Yolanda Strangers, who are social scientists, actually, Definitely. primarily. Uh, and, and um, you know, uh, Sarah Pink, in fact, is a joint appointment with uh, Monash Art Design and Architecture um, faculty. And also, like, so long as you have at least two supervisors from the two faculties, I don't see any constraints from two out of the three faculties. I don't see any constraints and they're bringing yet another supervisor in um, from other faculties outside those to, to bolster the cross-disciplinarity. Uh, in, in general, we're very much uh, keen to develop this um, human behavioral aspect uh, in, in this work. You know, for too long, the whole energy space has been dominated by engineering and economics. Um, and so, yeah, let, let, let's explore that if we can. Uh, where are we now? Oh, stop that, Sarah. Can't keep track of <laughs> uh, what I'm reading. Hi. Okay, Paul, um, there's one for you here. Um, okay, uh, yeah. let me have a look I at that. Love to read that. Uh, what are the raw data you need for a techno economic and sensitivity study? Do you need the market profile of the product? You can't do blah, blah, blah. It sounds very specific question. Um, but uh, look, we, we have all the data we need. Uh, you know, Woodside have an agreement with us. It doesn't mean they completely open and give us everything that we need. Uh, they're a company, they have to protect their assets. And so um, where the data is relevant for the project, they will share it with us. And, uh, and so we will use that data if needed, or we will access it from the public domain or other sources. So that's not really a problem. The second one, uh, carbon sequestration, are you guys exploring pre, post, or oxyfuel? The answer is none of the above. Uh, we're not looking at CCS on coal at all. Coal is, the, is a C word that we don't use. We're looking at gas and we're looking at decarbonizing gas. So we have nothing to do with coal. Thanks. So um, I have one semester to go for my master's degree. Am I still eligible? Um, I think we answered that one. Yeah, well, I, I think I think you can put an expression of interest and, uh, let, and, I, and I think then we'll go through the process, yeah? yeah? What criteria do you look for in successful applicants? Oh, I'll let Tanya answer that. <laughs> uh, um, obviously, you have to meet the um, academic um, and English language requirements, um, but then the rest, you know, is really um, uh, to do with um, the achievements the student has made. Um, their, um, so academic merit, uh, definitely, but also, you know, if there are any publications, there are any research experience, um, research assistantship, um, any awards, study awards, things like that. So um, we do look at that as well. And um, also, I think, um, uh, Paul, with regards to um, the suitability of the uh, student with regards to the project um, and the ex uh, the sort of expertise behind with re in relation to the project would that um, apply as well? Yes, and I think um, you know almost more than the technical expertise. To be honest, you know these are these are the scholarships. All of them that we're talking about tonight, in which you're engaging with industry, and we want to. I want to be able to see when I interview you that this is something that you're passionate about that you 
you you know you you initially want to they're not going to sit back and watch you for a distance and three years later get your thesis they want to interact with you every month see what you're doing make sure that that they understand what you're doing and you understand their their needs and so you need to demonstrate i guess from my standpoint that you are happy to engage um uh, with with the industry and uh, and happy to to understand what their needs are so it's really it's it's an industry phd um or, and it doesn't matter whether you're doing it from a social sciences angle or from a maths angle um and and you know we we'll, we make we're not going to put you on a project that you don't have skills for it doesn't help anyone uh so we will match the project to your skills thanks tempo so there's a question about uh, the uh, English language requirements. So uh, I would say that um, you need to sit the exam again until you pass. I don't see any other way around it unless I'm mistaken. I don't think living in Australia is, is going to be uh, able to be used as a um, case for waiver. Am I right, Tanya? In some circumstances, you can actually make a case, but it would actually be very, very dependent on the actual application um, and what you're going to use to make the case. I think you've got here that you've written a paper in English, but it will determine, you know, the what type of paper, what contribution is, um, is it a Q1, is it a high ranked um, journal, you know, are you first author, uh, all that sort of stuff will be taken into account. Um, and it's also on a case by case basis. So there is no guarantee. The best thing is to actually go and reset the English exam again. So with, uh, the, uh, Tom submitting a EOI anyway, just just to um, with providing us with all their information, uh, and then you know in the meantime go and sit the exam again as well, obviously if you can. And um, there's, a, there's a little bit of a window between when you put in the EOI and when you actually formally apply to the to the program. And so I think it might be worth just getting registered in the system in our system. Just on that note, also, yeah. isn't um, if if you're currently a student at Monash or and or other university, um, I think doesn't that count if you do your um, if you do your degree and it's taught in English, um, that would count as well. Yep. So that would be language of instruction. So if you're here at Monash and you're currently um, completing your um, Bachelor of Engineering or IT, then yes, that will count as well. Great. Thanks. That's that's very helpful. Um, so, will the three Woodside Scholarship PhD students effectively be working as a team? Paul? So, um, they would not be working as a team on the project, but we have every intention of creating a cohort of students. So, you may well be co located with, with other PhD students in the Woodside building. Um, and, and that might be your, you know, your, if you're in a lab, that might be your home away from the lab. Um, so even though you're not going to be necessarily working with another student on your project, you will be, and we will certainly would like to have um, events and seminars and so on for those students in the, in the Woodside cohort, we would like to build it up. So we would hope that you would certainly work uh, or, or at least have fun as a team and get to meet the, the Woodside delegates when they do come out and visit us as a team of PhDs. Right. So we've got another seven minutes to go. Um, I'm just wondering, there's uh, see if I can find some questions for Lakshan. Um, here and because uh, he hasn't got a chance to answer any, I'd like to, to give him a chance to do that. I think that's very helpful. Um, there's one from Alex Lakshan. What coursework units are you currently doing? Are these related to energy research or something else? Um, so, hi Alex. So I took a coursework unit last semester um, and it was on wild caught data. So it was basically introducing me um, how to handle uh, data sets and um, organize it in a um, strategic manner. Um, and so that's useful, I guess, um, for the PhD program. Um, I, there's a lot of like self-study in the first year as well. So um, even though um, I'm not taking any units related to energy. I'm still have I still have to like read through textbooks and understand the um, core concepts. Um, I think for the engineering um, PhD, there's only two uh, coursework units that you need to take. 
um, but because in my undergraduate degree degree I I already took a master's unit so that was waived so I only had to do one unit so um, yeah that's uh, my experience. Right. Let's see if there's any um, other questions for Lakshan. I can't see anything. Anybody want to, if they want to ask Lakshan, punch one in straight away and I'll go back to the other ones. Um, um, is, uh, is this only for BN students or can be a business honours law? students apply anybody can apply so long as they meet the criteria of um, one of the uh, faculties uh, entrance criteria uh, one of the faculties yeah so by the way you can i believe we um the way we do it and is we we pick a faculty for your main supervisor in terms of the process and we just go through that faculty's requirements and then um we move on from there does it cost to study the PhD, the tuition fee? So the answer is typically with a scholarship. When you get the scholarship, you also get a tuition scholarship if you're Australian, domestic, um, uh, permanent resident or citizen. Yes, Tanya? Yep. So the um, government provides for our domestic students, the government provides what they call an RTP fees offset. So um, the tuition fees are actually covered by um, the government for domestic students. Um, if you are an international student, because I noticed down the bottom there, there was a question about international students. Um, then for international students, yes, there is um, a tuition fee, um, which you would need to cover because um, the scholarships do not. Um, the Zima and the Woodside scholarships do not cover the um, tuition fee. If you do apply for a Monash scholarship, um, uh, then yes, there are um, scholarships which cover the stipend as well as the tuition. Um, and you could still work on a project with um, researchers within the Energy Institute as well. Great, thank you. I found, uh, I found a great question at the bottom for Lakshan. Oh, uh, yeah. Right down um, the bottom. Okay, yeah, about the academia or industry. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, I think one of the good things about the um this AMO, the Zima Energy Studies, is that you have a choice. Um, you can choose when at the end, um, whether you want to continue with the research or go into industry. Um, and so in AMO, there's a lot of a lot of the um staff at AMO, they are PhDs as well. So they definitely like look for employing PhD people. Um, and that's one of the reasons is because like in a bachelor's degree, you can only go so far into into depth. Whereas um a lot of the problems that's facing the energy sector now you need to go like in more research and have a more um a better understanding so definitely within AMO having a PhD is um is uh, a good thing uh when you're applying um and it also it's also helpful because you can get their feedback and when you're framing a topic um so essentially at the start um the first few meetings I've sort of had a couple of projects that I was proposing and then I could get the, uh, the feedback from AMO and um, help and that that's really helpful to get the industry insight into um, narrow down I guess the field that I want to uh, pursue but yeah there's definitely an opportunity if you want to go into industry and always stay in, stay in research so, so I guess there was sort of a second part of that question that you know you know do you get the feeling that the Australian energy sector values people with PhDs um, given what you've heard um, yeah, definitely. I think um, it's definitely um, looked looked sought after because um, you need um, a lot of analytical skills to tackle the problems. Um, and yeah, like a PhD is all about like um, independent learning and um, and those those are all like valuable skills. Fantastic. I'd like to can I just add something to that, Ariel? Uh, particularly with respect to Woodside, we've actually got three or four people at Woodside who who want to do a PhD with us while they're working at Woodside, and uh, and there's a, been a real interesting shift, I think, in industry uh, as we go into this next phase of, of, of development in Australia. You know, high tech is going to be the name of the game in the future, and you don't get there by not doing a PhD. So um, the guys I work with at Woodside, all four of them all have PhDs. And uh, and so, you know, and I'm very, they're very comfortable working and communicating across all levels of research with us. 
And so um, they absolutely value PhDs. And I think that's increasing in, in Australian industry. On the same note, there's a question here saying, um, does experience in the energy sector, is that um, also counted in favour for your application? I Certainly, I had experience in, in, in the relevant job before I went for a PhD. Uh, each case, as Tanya said, is looked at differently. Um, but certainly, if you've got knowledge and experience from that area um, and you can you understand the problem uh, well, that is very useful um, to be able to show that. Sure, so. but you know, it's more of a, um, what's it called, tiebreaker. You know, if we have two candidates, you know, uh, the, the academic merit is strongly um, uh, favoured here. Um, and so, but then if you've got two roughly equally good candidates, industry experience will certainly count in your favour. That's fair to say. All right, look, we're um, run out of time. My apologies. There's a lot more questions, and um, you can send them to any of us. Um, uh, is it? Um, I think we got most of the questions. They're all quite similar. The only one I would say is about the deadlines. Um, they're all on the website, um, and there's one here about um, when will the recruitment open next year. So for Woodside, uh, if you're looking to recruit again next year. When will it, I would presume it's going to be around the same time next year. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and the same for, for the Zemo scholarship. So Exactly. Um, but, you know, of course, um, you can always apply for a, a standard scholarship as well. And, um, and, you know, you know, we want all of you who want to do a PhD at Monash to come and do a PhD at Monash uh, in these areas. Um, I mean, the Zima and the Woodside are the prestigious ones, but standard scholarships are pretty good too. And, um, you know, uh, please, please be in touch, right? We'd love to have all of you who are qualified, who are eligible to, to join us. And you could work with each other. Like, just because you haven't got the SEMA scholarship doesn't mean you can't work with Lakshan and whoever else has got the, um, the, the scholarship, right? And so we wanna, we're building a big team of students and their supervisors in a cross-disciplinary way under the Institute and our Good Innovation Hub. And within our other initiatives, uh, there's Woodside, obviously, and there's the uh, Race for 2030 CRC and um, Net Zero initiative. So there's a lot to do. And uh, so, yeah, please, please uh, register your interest, even if, um, you know, even if in the end you may not get this one or be quite eligible yet because you haven't finished your degree, we'll have a record of you and we'll be able to um, put you in touch with other supervisors. So there's plenty more than just four scholarships, really. <laughs> in some ways, but, but these are the, the cream of the crop. So yeah, thank you. Does anybody else want to say anything? Uh, Tanya, Rakshan, Paul, or Sarah? Looking forward to seeing you all, meeting you all. Yeah, absolutely. Let's let's uh, let's try and solve these energy problems that we have as a as a nation. Yeah, and do it quickly. No time to lose. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, thank you again, um, Sarah and Paul and Akshan and Tanya, and thank you again, Nancy and Srijan for uh, putting this together. It's quite a lot of work goes behind the scenes for, for these things, so um, and never to be underestimated.